Uh, so I'll start the next uh, session. So the topic is treatment. And our uh, first speaker is going to be Dr. Spencer Walsh. He's a research chemist at the USDA facility, the USDA ARS facility at, at Parlier, California. And uh, so if you're all set to go, Spencer. I believe I am, Greg. Can you see uh, Can you yeah. see this presentation? Okay, great. Yep. All right, well, uh, in the essence of time here, we're going to make this quick. This is going to be like a commercial. Um, all right, so my name is Spencer Walsh. I'm a chemist with uh, ARS. Got a lab in Parlier, California, kind of the center of Fresno County. Uh, and I also have a lab at UC Davis where we work on all the quarantine pests, of which one is a spotted lanternfly. So I'm gonna tell a little story about what we do, what we bring to the table, and, uh, and, and, and how we're kind of hitting the ground running here with spotted lanternfly. Okay, so my program, what we do is we uh, proactively address consumer and regulatory demands for the global ag market, all right? And so pest species like spotted lanternfly, it's, uh, you know, the latest in a long list of, of nasty invasives. And, um, and here's just a Google engram kind of showing uh, the magnitude of the problem. As global ag developed in the 60s, so too has the need to control invasive quarantine insects, et cetera. And unfortunately, Terms like fumigation and, and systems approaches, which is what we use to control them, have not kept the same pace. So that means uh, there's a lot of work to be done. All right, so number one rule here in my lab is ag, clay, uh, ag trade is global. And it's a mix of politics, economics, and science. Of course, we mostly do with the science, but you can't divorce them. Okay, number two, ag trade is consumer driven. Consumers are scared at least in my opinion. Here's this phobialist.com, love this website. Scared consumers drive regulation, okay? And, and this is a topic for another day, but the things that consumers are most scared about is knowing what it takes to put uh, uh, food on the table. They want, you know, organic, no GMO. They want dates in the summer. They want oranges in the summer. And uh, they, you know, they want peaches in the winter. I mean, this is, this is what we all deal with, right? Uh, so with globalization of ag, we have increased demands on pest-free security, increased demands on food safety. So we need to use insecticides and herbicides. We need to use antimicrobials, but of course, the chemistries that we can use to control these things are limited. And, and this, is the, this is the nightmare uh, that, that at least I, I wake up to every day. Okay, so number three rule, you gotta understand the system that you're working with, all right? And the system goes all the way from pre-plant and GMO strategies all the way through post-harvest channels. We focus on post-harvest channels and predominantly because that's where we have the greatest certainty in our control elements. As you work retrospectively forward in the system, it's relatively uncertain. So when we wanna control a pest, we anchor our strategies in quantifiable certainty and rely less on those situations which we are more uncertain about. Okay, so here's a snapshot or a cartoon of the California citrus industry. It starts in the field, they, they pick the fruit, they put the fruit in the bins, they wash the fruit, they pack the fruit, and then they gotta get it to market. This is where they make all their money. You don't wanna think of the system like that you wanted the system working retrospectively from where we have the most control, which is right before it moves to, uh, meets the consumer. This strategy, E.J. Corey, a famous chemist, this is how he, he designed molecules. You, you start with the target you're trying to achieve, the one you're the most certain of, you work retrospectively forward, but backward. Okay, so one way to rationalize this, I think everyone will, will, will understand very quickly. We have a chamber fumigation. It doesn't matter if we do that fumigation once, five times, 100,000 times. There's low variation. We have high confidence in the reproducibility of that control measure. Conversely, when you take a field spray, you have relatively low confidence. So if you're building a, a, uh, a train of thought to a trade partner that you've got a control of a situation, 
you want to increase reliance on those elements that you have confidence in. Okay, that's why we rely on post harvest so heavily. All right, and we threw the consumer in here so you guys understand that's that's really uh, the bottom line. Okay, so this these approaches are, are really kind of recognized around the world, in particular through the USDA efforts of ARS and conducting research on efficacious efficacious pest mitigation systems approaches fumigations. This is what we use to open market access, retain market access. Okay. Well recognized. A real poignant example of this in the last 10 years that we started working on was spotted wing drosophila. Spotted wing drosophila came out, came in, uh, got out of control very quickly, as we all know. It virtually shut down our export markets for uh, fresh fruit to Australia overnight. You had all these industries basically stack up and say, hey, Spencer, start start cracking at this problem. Okay. Real interesting problem in turning feeding larvae, et cetera. Um, but there's a lot of money on the table. So the commodity boards all get involved. They, they grab me. The fumigation service providers all want uh, you know, to help out. And so we work with them. And then obviously we liaise with, with the trade partners. And it's just Australia and New Zealand that really value their uh, ecological security. Uh, you know, rest assured, they're, they're, they're probably watching this right now. Uh, because spotted lanternfly is is such an issue, and is going to be even bigger. Well, in the sake of ta sake of table grapes, of course, we define this system, and uh, and we figure out how we can um, pick out or take advantage of certain elements in the table grape export system in order to uh, continue to trade. And in in this particular case, we started with methyl bromide but we ended up shifting over to a, a sulfur dioxide cold treatment in order to preserve trade and, and essentially uh, keep everybody happy, so to speak, keep, keep the consumer happy. All right, now another probably even more um, appropriate analogy would be brown marmorated stink bug. All right, so this thing came through. I remember on Christmas Eve of, uh, I wanna say it was 2012, I got a call from New Zealand uh, about, acquiring about the, the data that we had collected on methyl bromide uh, with methyl bromide in the control of brown marmorated stink bug. Of course, everyone was concerned with brown marmorated stink bug, or at least in Australia and New Zealand, uh, because they started to intercept uh, these in their, their shipments of consignments, uh, started kind of automobiles and, and farm equipment and recreational vehicles. But of course, that, uh, that concern uh, also does extend to not only our horticultural sector, our exporters, but also the, the horticultural producers in, uh, of the trading partners. Okay, and we all know, I mean, stink bug, this is the number one issue in Australia and New Zealand. And um, I'm not gonna go through and review all the, 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 the nasties with the stink bug, but the bottom line is, you know, we developed the heat treatments. We developed methyl bromide fumigations very rapidly. We developed a sulfuryl fluoride treatment so that we could continue shipping automobiles and these consignments, even, even tiles and lawn furniture uh, from the States over into, and Europe into Australia and New Zealand. And then most recently, we, we uh, developed an ethyl formate fumigation that can be used potentially on arrival in New Zealand and Australia. Um, for, for those consignments uh, potentially originating uh, outside of the US or, or, or Europe. Uh, ethyl formates registered in Australia and New Zealand, they can use it as an on arrival treatment. Okay. So that gives you an idea of, of kind of how we approach this, how we rapidly respond, um, et cetera. So the bottom line is these fumigants, you know, you think they're a can of worms and, and Pandora's box, but, but they're actually the golden goose that in many cases allows us uh, to continue trade. All right, and there's a lot to developing these post-harvest fumigants. The first and foremost is targeted efficacy. And, and that's what we're, uh, that's the stage we are at right now with spotted lanternfly. But there's all this peripheral information that needs to be gathered, worker and consumer exposure, bystander and environmental exposures. We do all of that, but we take it one step at a time. In order to do all of that, we have to liaise with basically the EPA, their state level equivalents, and then international uh, equivalents, as, as well as all the registrants, because if the registrants aren't committed to this, uh, we go nowhere. 
Uh, not only then do you have to do that, and this is the looking down the looking down the um, uh, the road for spotted lanternfly. I mean, these types of treatments have to be coordinated with potentially foreign partners, federal and state agencies, and then of course local and county. Uh, out in California, everything uh, everything starts grassroots right at the county level, and uh, it really complicates what what ultimately uh, is brought to the table. Now, the one thing you can't deny is that post-harvest fumigants work, all right? And I'm not going to spend too much time here with only 25 minutes talking about each and individual fumigant. But the bottom line is the ones on the top of the screen behave the most like gases. As you work down, uh, these fumigants are, are, are more, have more and more of a liquid property at uh, normal atmospheric pressure. Those that are highlighted in green are ones that we're going to be targeting first with spotted lanternfly. So phosphine, other than fertilizer, this is the most valuable agrochemical in the world. You've got sulfuryl fluoride. Its post-embryonic toxicity is unparalleled. We have methyl bromide. This is the gold standard. Methyl bromide is so important because it is registered everywhere. Okay? Not only is it efficacious, it is registered everywhere. Hydrogen cyanide. Uh, we're starting to see a resurgence in the registrations of hydrogen cyanide. We've got propylene oxide. This is the most like methyl bromide, indiscriminately uh, alkylates, nitrogens, and sulfurs. And then we have ethyl formate, which is very attractive from a, a grass, generally recognized as safe perspective, uh, residues, et cetera, and can be incredibly toxic to surface pests. Um, ethyl formate's use on, on post-embryonic uh, spotted lanternfly, uh, this is a no-brainer. In fact, I'd say this for all these compounds. We're concerned about eggs. Almost every fumigation project we work with, eggs are what we're trying to target, with the exception of brown marmorated stink bug. Okay, another real important complexity of post-harvest fumigants, what you got to understand is how they work. And we can generally group them into two groups. We've got those that are reactive. Like I said, methyl bromide and propylene oxide uh, react with nucleophiles, really any nitrogen and sulfur in biomolecules, RNA, DNA, you name it, proteins, they alkylate them. Okay, so you not only have the initial toxicity, but you have all the fallout toxicity associated with alkylation. You got sulfuryl fluoride, all right? This must hydrolyze to release fluoride in order to be toxic. The other hydrolysate, fluoryl sulfate, is relatively non toxic. So you got to react to release the fluoride. Ethyl formate hydrolyzes to release formic acid. And, uh, and then you've got non-reactive gases like phosphine. This is the most reduced form of phosphine um, or uh, yeah, phosphorus. It will slowly oxidize through various P450 processes, but it's a mitochondrial inhibitor, okay? And then hydrogen cyanide, which inhibits cytochrome C oxidase. Okay, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because if we take a look at the insect egg, we can pretty much say what gases are going to work and what gases are not going to work, right? So here I have uh, the dried fruit beetle egg on the left, okay? This is a common cosmopolitan stored product insect. Beetle eggs, for the most part, are like bathtubs. Porcelain, thick corian, the only place that you can get a gas in are these two little arrow piles right here, okay? A moth egg, conversely, this is navel orange worm, another big pest here in California. At every one, every one of these interstitials, you've got an arrow pile. You also have a big micro pile. We can get gas easier to get the into a parts. moth relative yeah. to a beetle, okay? So um, we want to really take a look at every individual species of, of egg. And, and, and why is this important? Because if I, if, if, if I've got to get the gas in, all right, they're all going in, but the reactive gases have to, to react with the biomolecules, whereas the metabolic gases, your phosphine and hydrogen cyanide, uh, they're taken up metabolically. We also need to consider, of course, the rates of development. Beetles mature relatively quickly to, uh, compared to moths, okay? So a moth's metabolism is slower. Phosphine is relatively less effective in hydrogen cyanide, whereas with a beetle, they're developing very quickly. So that little bit of phosphine and hydrogen cyanide that get in, 
is very, very effective. Okay. Now we know that the diffusion of these gases is absolutely what's trying it. Here's an image of a dried fruit beetle egg again, a porcelain battleship with just these two little, two little arrow piles. Uh, fumigating with osmium tetroxide, you can see at either end where we've turned the egg dark is where that osmium is getting in. So we know this is how uh, the gas is getting into the eggs. Other, other insects, you know, are, are kind of a hybrid. Here's cigarette beetle. Most of the egg looks like a impenetrable beetle egg, but the other end of the egg actually has quite a few uh, pores that we can get the gas in. All right, so here's spotted lanternfly. I was initially very, very concerned. Those of you who are familiar with these eggs, you know, they've got that really interesting material that they're all coated in. Uh, and then once you get all that stuff away, you've got like almost like a bird or a lizard egg that pops very, very thick. And uh, I was concerned, but we've, we've got these wonderful SEM images now. And you can clearly see there's plenty of porosity, including this top hatch that we should be able to take advantage of when trying to kill uh, these insect eggs. Okay, uh, here's another image, uh, 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 a side view here where you can see some of the pores associated with, uh, with the top of the egg and the egg hatch. Nice big huge crack, getting a gas through there is gonna be no problem whatsoever. Uh, take a look at some of those pores too. Those pores appear to penetrate all the way into the egg. So this is very promising. I don't know what quite these structures are, these hexagonal structures on the surface. I still also, as a, as a chemist, am, am just amazed uh, that biologists try to tell me these are one cell. I just, I just cannot believe these structures are so incredibly powerful. Okay, so very important is this egg hatch, right? We can use this uh, to diagnose survivability following the fumigations. So obviously we'll have our controls and we'll understand control mortality and deal with that statistically, uh, but we will be able to very easily confirm vacated or surviving eggs following the treatment. Okay, that seems to be the little lip that seals, uh, that seals the door into the, the crevasse. Okay, so what are we doing here? Well, we teamed up with uh, Tracy Lessie and her team in November of 2022 to go out and collect, uh, I think a thousand cages worth. Each cage has probably got somewhere between 20 and 40 egg masses on it. We've shipped them over to UC Davis where we'll be doing a series of fumigation treatments. And generally, we're gonna be starting with the maximum rates or applied dosage that are allowed for each of these fumigants over generally long time courses. And, and, and instances like this where we're trying to figure out if fumigation uh, is gonna work, we're gonna go with the heaviest schedule, so to speak, and then work backwards from there to see if we can peel off, all right? We're repping this out. We're doing multiple pseudo reps or cages per treatment. We'll repeat and refine this each year and eventually work towards a commercial scale. It's important to note that it's actually the fumigation service providers who first approached me on this. They were getting call after call from New Jersey and Philadelphia wondering what's the schedule that we should be using to transport these basically non-horticultural consignments and nobody knew. So that's gonna be a big goal of this project is to figure out if any of the schedules or any of the opportunities we have on the books right now for commercial fumigation are gonna work. Okay, so one of the treatment nuances, and I think there's going to be a lot of things that we learn in this study that are going to be applicable to others. Uh, one is that um, there's a tendency for some mold to grow uh, on the wood and, and, and or eggs. And uh, we, we always use a, a, a potassium or sodium sorbate a dip in order to minimize that mold, which really allows us to isolate the effect of these fumigations moving forward. So all these eggs before treatment, when they're warmed, are getting a, 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 a sanitation treatment. They go into the chambers. These are all naked fumigations, trying to determine what the efficacy or what the uh, uh, what exposure is required for efficacy. They're fumigated. All right. We sent 300 cages to UC Davis. All right. We sent uh, and fumigated a set in early February. Another set just arrived, I think, yesterday. 
And we'll do another set in April. These are all from the same cohort collected over the same uh, four or five day span. Right? The February and March groups are gonna be refrigerated or further winterized following the treatment. And then all three groupings will be warmed after April fumigations. Now, why are we doing this? Well, we need to identify the impact of developmental latency on fumigation efficacy. Okay. This is incredibly important because we want to figure out uh, when and if during a, you know, the export of logs, which are harvested in early winter through mid winter uh, or, or any consignment thereof uh, should be treated to control SLF, uh, you know, should the need be there. Okay, and, and why, why latency? What, like, what, what are we talking about? Well, this pest right here, this is one that we've worked with in citrus for about 25 years. I uh, know I would say the 80s, that's more than 25 years ago. This is Fuller's rose beetle, this little guy here. He, uh, they lay, well, it's all females actually, they lay their eggs up in, uh, under the button of oranges. And this is our number one, has been for years, number one quarantine pest with Korea, okay? So it's a big deal. And these eggs, uh, also uh, have, a, have a very long duration of latency. Uh, sometimes four or five months will pass before these eggs hatch, even under refrigerated conditions. And we'll do time-lapse photography, just like spotted lanternfly. And uh, there'll be no nucleation in the egg, no nucleation in the egg for months and months and months and months. And then boom, over a two-day period, you'll get nucleation, you'll get, you, you know, and then two days later, out comes the neonate, right? And, and we have a sneaking suspicion that that's what's going on with, of course, spotted lanternfly, and we need to get a handle on this. Now, the one big difference, important difference between spotted lanternfly and Fuller's rose beetle is that spotted lanternfly has all these cracks and crevices, crevices where we can get these gases into the egg and hopefully make them count. These Fuller rose beetle eggs uh, being laid in oranges and in sprinkler heads, et cetera, uh, are, are, are really uh, quite um, impervious to, to gas and water. You can see these images here, of just these small little arrow piles. So that's a one pro we've got working. Even though we've got this latency with spotted, spotted lanternfly that can be complicating, we feel that the porosity of the eggs is going to make it more amenable to fumigation. And time will tell. I'm really looking forward to, uh, to reporting results out to, to the APHIS team and all these cooperators as soon as we get them. But we've got to be patient for another two months because we've got to see what this effective latency is. Hopefully, Greg, I kept it in the, uh, within the oh, time yeah. frame. Well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, I really appreciate you condensing that down. It was a ton of information for you to uh, squash down from 45 to 25. But yeah, I appreciate it. And uh, there are a couple of questions uh, in the in the Q and A. If you want to uh, go in there, Spencer, if that's all right, and um, and address those. I think there was just the one actually right now that was related to you about uh, do you expect methyl bromide to be exempted from the phase out forever? Exempted. That was the question. You um, did. Do I? Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I I hope so. I I hope that um, my hope is that. That, that, that people, that folks understand that the critical role that methyl bromide plays um, should, should be protected. And take, take brown marmorated stink bug, take spotted lanternfly, take um, spotted winged drosophila. The, the deal with methyl bromide is uh, we need the tool that we know will work to come to the rescue. Once, once we can preserve trade and find an alternative, then that's the direction we head. We've seen it time and time again. But when stuff happens overnight and you need a go-to, we need QPS methyl bromide. And, and I'd like to think people are finally realizing this. Um, and, uh, and I know that uh, there's, there's a lot of support for that in the international community, at least those who who do do what I do? Um, that's the world you know we live in. If if you take methyl bromide away, um, you're 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 really missing an incredibly valuable tool uh, that's that's versatile. So I do expect GPS methyl bromide to continue. 
I, I expect it's used to continue to be more and more, um, let's say, governed and examined under a microscope so that we're not frivolously, frivolously using it or, or um, you know, using it in scenarios where they're not absolutely required. But, but, but certainly, uh, spotted lanternfly is, a, is, a, is another great case of how uh, having that tool right out of the gates is, is, is very powerful. All right. Thanks, Spencer. Okay, uh, so we'll go on to the, the next presenter, which is uh, Dr. Phil Lewis, and he's with our uh, Forest Pest Method Lab at our, uh, with the USDA in uh, Massachusetts. So uh, it's like you're all set to go, Phil. All right, thanks, Greg. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to go over some of the treatment and management approaches that we've been looking at for spotted lanternfly. And, uh, you know, our lab is uh, very much uh, the research support for various programs, including the spotted lanternfly. And, Wanted to give it a shout out to uh, my great technicians who helped make all this possible, Amanda, Emily, and Melissa, who joins us in the summers. Um, so I, I wanted to today just briefly show uh, some of the results that we've been, uh, projects that we've been working on this, this past year. Uh, first is uh, egg mass treatments with uh, soybean oil. Um, and then also looking at air cargo and the transport of spotted lanternfly uh, by that route into uh, other states, and then using this uh, simulated cargo space as a air to test different aerosol treatments. And then also uh, a project looking at uh, direct sprays of non uh, non insecticidal products, uh, oils. Um, but before I go into those three, I wanted to um, get into some of the work I've done previously, um, I usually don't uh, speak at the summit here. So I thought I'd just give a brief overview of some of the chemical treatment approaches that we've done, traditional chemical treatment approaches for spotted lanternfly. Uh, and early on when um, spotted lanternfly was, became a big issue in 2017, 2018, um, I did a, a bunch of comparisons, treatment comparisons. And the first, uh, the most traditional approach that the program has been employing and also the State Departments of Ag is a bark spray application of Danotefuron, which you can see occurring there. And also looking at different of uh, these systemic chemicals, um, which can uh, the tree can take up and transport around um, and, and be effective in that way. And then what we did was with these tree to trees, we put uh, tarps down up to the drip line and then monitored um, mortality. So the initial uh, insecticide that we looked at was dinotefion, of course, uh, metacloprid. And we also looked at mmectin benzoate, which is an uh, effective insecticide for emerald ash borer, especially. Um, trees were treated in late August. Um, and then we monitored mortality on the tarps over a six week period and basically going every two or three days um, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Fridays in general uh, to, to check the tarps and clear them and reset them. And uh, some of the treatments are quite uh, impressive. And this is a four hour count. You can see hundreds of, of lanternfly and uh, flared wings to show evidence of the poisoning that's happening there. So the results from 2018, I just want to show this graph briefly. Uh, this was a high population year. You could see the average we had five four or five trees in each of the treatments. We um, did a trunk injection with the dinotefuron in, in green here. Um, the traditional bark spray was in the red. And these are our average numbers of dead lanternflies on the tarps. And then trunk injection with the metacloprid is in this line here. I mean, mectin benzoate was basically no different than the controls. It just did not work at all. Uh, the insects were just not uh, susceptible to it. But you know, these first few sampling days, you can see the averages are over 3,000. Uh, some of the trees had uh, over 7,000 after two days, so it's quite impressive numbers. And I just wanted to give a few brief uh, takeaways from this study. And what we were seeing was just this continuous wave of lanternflies coming into these trees. Uh, it was a property that uh, was managed, and so the the trees were actually out in the open and had uh, open grass around them, but out in the woods near the property, there were a large tree of heaven nearby that probably was a source uh, for all these insects that were coming in. Um, one thing that we did notice and has been mentioned before in these talks is that 
there seem to be, there are certain trees, and I saw this year to year as well, that certain trees were attractive to the spotted lanternflies uh, and were obviously we're seeing more mortality under some of these trees than others uh, with the same kind of treatments. Uh, overall, over the six week period, we had over a quarter of a million insects that were, were counted on the tarps. It was quite impressive. Um, we did see this catch decline over time that you can see on the graph here, uh, starting in mid-September, start to see this decrease in what was caught. And uh, that's been mentioned before on, in these talks as well with the migration. And so we see once the uh, adults feed and mate, they disperse. And that was what was happening at these plots. Um, so just as a summary then, you know, we saw this uh, trend of the dino, um, dino tephuron trunk injection had the highest residue values and also had the highest mortality. And um, this is what we saw for those trees that were treated. We, we had a huge amount of product, 100 parts per million in these trees um, on average. But then we see this decline over time. So by the end of the season, we're uh, averaging about 50 parts per million. And for the other chemicals, uh, for the trunk injected imidacloprid, it was uh, much less, but stable over time, uh, 35 parts per million. And the same with the bark spray. So this is the same chemical, dinotefuron, but put out as a bark spray. And then I think what happens in this case is that you get continuous uptake from the bark. It's like a source for the tree so that uh, those levels were consistent over time and came in at about 12 parts per million. Um, I've been asked before, you know, well, if we're seeing such high numbers, um, maybe we don't have to treat every year, um, but especially for uh, dinotephron and the others, other treatments that we see pretty minimal carryover, maybe one or two parts per million at most that we'll see in the following year from these treated trees. Um, another thing to keep in mind is for the trunk injection compared to the bark spray applications, uh, you're putting on 11 times more product. So for instance, for a 10 inch tree, you're putting about two and a half grams of at the active ingredient uh, on a 10 inch tree, injecting it into it. Whereas a bark spray, you're putting on 27 grams of material. So you can really reduce the amount of product that you're uh, putting out into the environment with these trunk injections. Of course, there's downsides to it. And um, I think Tina from Virginia will be talking about that later today, but uh, there are options and possibilities for this uh, to improve our footprint on uh, the insecticides that we're putting out there. Um, the other question and one that I am curious about too is that we saw this trend for higher mortality with the trunk injected dinotephron. And uh, I haven't been able to design a study yet or take the time to do it. But um, my question is for imidacloprid or these other treatments, uh, we're getting this immediate knockdown that you see for the trunk injection dinotephron, probably because of these high residue numbers. But um, for the other treatments, uh, the possibility is that they're just not being impacted so quickly. And so they might land on the tarp and then hop away or fly away. And we're not actually counting them, counting that mortality because they're just not present in those tarps. Um, so that, uh, that was just a, a brief uh, summary from previous work I've done. And then uh, to dive into stuff that we've been doing in the last few years is looking at a uh, large scale imp implementation of egg mass treatments. And this was undertaken by our field operations arm within PPQ. And um, we're using this golden pest spray oil. It's a 93% oil. It's mixed 50-50 with water and it's labeled for uh, egg masses, gypsy moth egg masses, which is originally why I started looking at it. I was familiar with the use of that product. And then uh, it's also now labeled for spotted lanternfly egg masses. And um, the general approach is to apply it as a spot treatment uh, when we see these egg masses. So this is the situation that we typically see in the field. So instead of trying to scrape all these egg masses, uh, it'd be much easier just to do a, a treatment spray. And this is work I've previously reported from one of our uh, internal reports. And what we saw, um, just a 
one slide on that. We could I tested traditional insecticides. Uh, some don't work. Uh, Chlorpyrifos and Tempo seem to work well, but golden pest spray oil was uh, fairly effective in these early studies that we did. And we continued to pursue that. And then that was then deployed um, in 2021. So this is the, the typical setup. We have tried to uh, target individual egg masses for monitoring uh, to look at emergence. And you can see the numbers and the push pins. And then uh, um, RTIS application was developed so that you could, uh, when you're going into a, a field and treating, you can identify trees, uh, locate them by DBH, and then note, note, note whether what color push pin it was. And of course, the trees are uh, located by GPS, so you can return then after these spring treatments and then uh, identify the ones that were treated or not treated and assess them for hatch. So that was done this past spring. It's, it's ongoing now. Uh, as long as the temperatures are above 40 degrees, uh, you can do field treatments uh, based on what the label allows. And um, so last year we had uh, four states and field crews from four states that utilized the app and then also assessed their uh, treatments. So what we found, we uh, I decided to group, uh, make four different groupings of, of hatch and from zero hatch to one to five nymphs, six to 10 nymphs hatching uh, in each egg mass and then greater than 11. So we saw, um, first thing is that the applications of the soybean oil impacted these first and last categories, one by greatly increasing the amount of zero hatch and then also greatly decreasing how many uh, mass hatches, which is typical. We usually see a lot of lanternflies once they hatch from an egg mass, they kind of do all at once here. Um, so we reduced that by to just 8% for the large hack patch group. Um, as an overall average, if they were treated with the uh, uh, golden oil, we saw just on average, just two to three nymphs uh, in each egg mass. So as an estimate of control, we had over 1200 egg masses that were surveyed. Uh, several hundred of those were controls, but of the 900, some that were treated with the oil, and taking an average of um, 36 eggs per mass, we can then come up with, um, we had 2,700, a little over 2,700 eggs that were uh, hatched out of those egg masses. So we had about 8% uh, hatch from the treated uh, egg masses. Um, we also did, my, my laboratory also did some parallel work. We treated about 400 egg masses and found similar um, results, and this is similar to uh, years before when we had treated in previous years, similar, similar results, about 92% control, reduced uh, nymphal hatch by at least tenfold. And we also looked at timing. So we looked at, um, my laboratory looked at timing in, say, in December compared to several weeks before hatch and, and looked at if there was any difference in when the oil could be applied and there wasn't any difference. Another impact that we saw is that we're probably missing some of the uh, control aspects because uh, you can see the some of the egg masses, these used to be intact egg masses. And then as a result of treating with the golden oil, you get the sloughing off of some of the eggs. So there's uh, additional level control that's found with that. Uh, moving on real quick here to air cargo and developing aerosol sprays for that. Um, this collaborative project with our PPQ cooperators in Delaware and also um, the Department of Defense, we used uh, facilities at um, Dover Air Force Base to look at this. So the reason for this is that uh, this is aircraft inspections uh, arriving in California, and they've, um, you know, they, they find various things in, in air cargo, but um, more recently they've been finding spotted lanternfly, uh, all dead, but they are finding uh, the adults. Uh, in the air cargo. So we wanted to look at uh, ways that we can mitigate that. So we set up uh, initial uh, look at this, just the simulated air cargo. We had three 20 foot containers that we lined with plastic and then uh, could put our insects in the cage, uh, the Tupperware containers and then spray that, uh, seal it up for required amount of time. And this is just uh, timing the spray so we can get the uh, required amount of grams per 
uh, square footage in there. And so just two slides then on results. Uh, we looked at early season adults and uh, tested various products, but I'll just show you the one that, that worked the best. Uh, and we have tested some uh, products that we've used before, but that are not available any longer. Uh, but this worked well at a, a 2X rate, 2X labeled rate. So these are the controls. You can see we looked at uh, the immediately right after treatment. Um, the controls were put in the, in the container and then removed after the 15 minutes of time and then assessed um, at zero, one hour, four hours, and 24 hours. And then looking at the, the, all the treatments for the one-shot material, uh, you can see that initially there's a lot of knockdown, um, morbidity, uh, high morbidity noted there. And then that um, mortality then kicks in at one hour, four hours, and then we had full mortality uh, at the 24 hour mark. We also wanted to look at late season adults uh, since they're quite different. Um, early season are just starting to feed and they're not as heavy. Um, so looking at the late season adults, which you can see here, you see the fat bodies on the sides of the insect. Uh, similar with controls, but we had difficulty keeping them alive. Um, we didn't put any uh, uh, feeding material in for them, but we did see mortality by uh, the 24 hour mark, even amongst our controls, but pretty good af after uh, one hour and four hour, there were no real impacts. Um, whereas the, the treatments seem to work uh, even better with these older insects. So we've um, uh, been working with the Department of Defense and uh, the Armed Forces Pest Management Board and uh, recommending this product as a suitable treatment um, for both Japanese beetle and then also spotted lantern fly. So uh, last study I wanted to go over is a uh, direct spray study that we did using various oils. And this was headed up by Emily um, in Pennsylvania, where we could uh, just go out in the field and collect and treat. And uh, we did this from early June. So all the life stages through uh, early October. So the various products that we tried, um, golden spray oil is, is labeled for use to, for insect control at 3% uh, and 2% as opposed to what we were doing with the egg masses at a 50-50 mix. Um, and there's a number of other horticultural products, oil products that are out there. Uh, this Lesco is a, a petroleum oil, also at 3% 2% concentrations. And, and another reason why they have such lower percent concentrations is that you get a lot of uh, phytotoxicity and burn on uh, foliage if, if you try to go much above that. There's also a, a purely green biopesticide. You can see the components that are in there that was labeled for uh, one and a half, two and a half percent concentrations. And then there was a botanical uh, product that's being sold locally at garden centers. That was a 2% peppermint oil with uh, surfactant and then controls. So the setup was uh, we did three replications in each treatment. Uh, 10 lanternfly specimens were included for each rep. And uh, you can see here, there's five insects within each cup. So this represents, um, let's say uh, the Lesco 2% would be these uh, group of six cups. And then the 3% of that product would be within these uh, six cups. So the solutions were applied with just a simple hand pump sprayer. Uh, we increased our number of uh, sprays once we got to the adult stage, they're just larger. We just wanted to get a full coverage on the nymphs and the adults when, when we did these treatments, just to see if we could get any impact. Um, we noted the nymphal instar stage, the adults were sexed uh, after they were uh, treated. We did observations then at 10 minutes following treatment, and then one hour and 24 hours. So results for the nymphs, you can see here's in each column, this is the, the treatments, 3% uh, and 2% of the two different oils, uh, the purely green 3%, the ash is 2.5% and 1.5%, and then the botanical product. Um, and then you could see that in general, the 10 minute, you see uh, this quick knockdown. There's not much recovery at the one hour except for uh, some of the 2% products, you can see some recovery, especially by the 24 hours. Uh, in general, you're, you were, we, we saw that 3% uh, 
formulations or concentrations work uh, better than the 2%. Um, these uh, letters that are after each, within each column, after each treatment are uh, letters that denote significance. So if the letter is the same, uh, there's no significant difference uh, between them. So in this case, the 2% and the 1%, there was no difference statistically between these two treatments, even though the averages are, are different. Um, you can see our botanical work quite well for the nymphs. One thing that we did note that we were kind of surprised that the purely green by the 24 hour mark, it, it just was not, um, the insects had uh, quite a few of them, majority of them had recovered. And so when we got to the adults, uh, once those started appearing in the field, we dropped the purely green product and, and did not test them. So that's the next slide I'll show you here. For the adults then, same setup, we checked them at 10 minutes, one hour, in 24 hours, uh, the big surprising thing was that the Lesco oil, which worked quite well for the nymphs, uh, we saw it was basically like a control treatment for the adults. And we're really not sure why that was, but the golden oil continued to perform well. Uh, wasn't any statistically difference at the 24 hour mark from the uh, botanical peppermint oil. And we had uh, pretty good results for our controls here, it's 20% mortality. So interesting study, um, and again, that's just preliminary. We're obviously totally soaking these insects uh, within these little cups. And what we wanna do this coming summer is uh, to look at real world, at world, real world application where we're, um, you know, you know, if people who work with spotted lanternfly know that if you try to spray them, uh, especially with a chemical, they, they get very active and mobile. So the question is, if we do do these treatments, um, will it have any impact like we're seeing here um, just because of their movement and they jump away and fly away? Uh, can we get enough material on them before they move um, to really impact them with these treatments? Uh, if you have any questions about any of these studies, I'm, I'm happy to uh, respond to your emails or any of the questions in the chat as well. So yeah, I'm happy to take any questions now. All right. Thanks, Phil. Yep. Yeah, it looks like there was just two for you in here maybe just yeah i think two about um i don't know if you have an answer to this sure. one but yeah. why uh, do you, uh, yeah that that's interesting you know they flare their wings um it's just part of uh the the nerve system reacting to the uh, pesticide that they get poisoned they can't uh function you know use their wings and function and uh, they're probably trying to fly and they just can't uh, get the, the muscles to work. So the, the wings flare and kind of are locked in like that. And they relax once once they, they die. Um, uh, the other question was the optimum time to apply the golden oil for effectiveness. Uh, well, that's what we're gonna be looking at this year. Uh, we, we were looking at the nymphs as well as up to the adults and we saw some pretty good impact on them. Um, but that, that's what we're gonna look at this year. Uh, and see if 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 it is an effective besides just these totally drenching them um, sit, situation that we tested. Okay, and there's just that, that timing last. on the egg mass treatment um, that can go on at any time. So we we treated in December and then all the way into the spring, uh, several weeks before egg hatch happened in the field in April. In the case of Pennsylvania, at least. Uh, so that can be put out anytime. The label, though, does uh, the manufacturer recommends that they not that you not put out treatments when it's 40 below 40 degrees. So it's really temperature dependent. Uh, the temperature is warm enough on that day. You could, if it's warm in February, you could do the treatment. All right. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, I don't know if you want to answer that to the last one uh, from Dave Anderson about the. Yeah, it was, uh, it's made by locally by uh, a person just selling it at um, at uh, local stores. Uh, it's called uh, Spotted Lanternfly Killer. So you can I can send you the information if you want. Just uh, send me an email. All right, thanks, Phil. And yep. uh, so I think we'll uh, move on to the the next speaker for this uh, topic. Um, it's uh, Brian, it'll be Brian Walsh. He's a horticulture educator with Penn State Extension. Now, if you're all all set to go, Brian. Yep. 
Yeah, you're up. Good. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep. All right. I'm going to leave my video off just to save bandwidth here a little bit. So the, uh, the a lot of what I'm actually going to touch on is is a bit touching on everybody else's stuff from today. And uh, really, the, the landscape treatments, the ornamental treatments, uh, is, are really dependent on timing and the location of where, where the insects are at and, and host at that point. And so uh, we can advance here. Whoop. So really understanding that movement and timing really should be what drives your decision making on where, when, and how to treat. And, and that combination of everything, including, um, as Phil was just talking about, it, it really, we, we really need to uh, understand those issues. You know, eggs, they're stationary, but they can be really difficult to reach. Detection is problematic, as Joe Keller was pointing out. Uh, maybe 50% that he said, I think he said that they were seeing from the ground. The nymphs, there's constant motion, but there's no flying. But that doesn't mean that they're not leaving the scene. And uh, Kelly Hoover showed that with the forest study. And when we get to the adults, there's a lot of motion. The flying can make those populations rapidly increase and decrease. And it's probably the most easy point of detection when the numbers are high in terms of life stage. But when there's low levels of population, it's very difficult to actually um, to detect them. And so that life cycle stage really needs to determine where you're looking and uh, when you're looking and what host you're actually looking for. And so if we take that whole environmental picture and we, we break it down of where these, these things are really thriving at, we can say natural forests, Laura Lady's work that did a lot with this and really they're not moving deep into the forest. They're not staying there. They seem to be more of an edge species. Agricultural crop landscapes, we see these um, with the exception of grapes, huge exception for grapes. But for the most part, we don't see this being a, a crop pest that's attacking things like alfalfa or, you know, even in the apples and the peaches, most of the growers around here are comfortable managing lanternfly with their normal uh, regimen of sprays. Uh, where we do see a lot of lanternflies are like bloom marsh, like Rick and David were showing today. There's natural areas, unmanaged right of ways, think uh, riparian areas, power lines, things like that. They tend to be full of invasive species and, and uh, which this, this bug definitely has a hankering for some of those invasive species that are all over in, in Southeast Pennsylvania. And then we get that inner tie of the suburban landscape where we have those natural areas, the ag areas, and then we get down to that urban landscape. And urban, I don't mean there, I don't mean it as a city, but more as the manicured. Right, so where you have the, uh, the the plants are all planted intentionally, maintained that kind of thing, and when we look at that, th this is a, a site in Topton in Berks County. Work's been going on here, I believe. Julie mentioned it yesterday. Since 2018, it is a good mix of all those areas, and when we look at this this site, what we see right up the middle is 50 red maples, and they're perfectly uh, replicated in age, size, planting time, and uh, it, they really have been a, a good place to do a lot of work, a lot of studies over the years. And that whole inner tie together really seems to be where we see lanternfly moving throughout its life cycle in a given season. And so when we look at this, this site here, we see that the, um, there's a little access road going out into this field, and that's where we usually park when we're doing our, our work on site. And June 2020, this is what we saw after three hours. This is my truck. These are first instar nymphs. And the question is, well, why are all these nymphs leaving the trees and, and trucking across this, this field, which was planted in wheat at the time? And so we walked out into the field, and what we see is those nymphs were very happy off the trees and getting a food, uh, getting a, a meal from the different uh, uh, plants growing in that wheat field, either the stalks themselves were the weeds that were growing interspersed then. And they were, they were just moving right along. And as we continue to monitor that, monitor that site in 2020, 
by the 4th of July, you can see these are our first end stars. We started a little bit late after the hatch. We were tied up a little bit with uh, Blue Marsh. But you can see that that population dropped right down by 4th of July. Second end stars barely makes a blip there. And this is across all 50 trees on that site. And in this eight foot live counts, this eight foot is, as I'm going to reference a couple times, is what we can comfortably see touch to eight foot that we can, we know for sure we're validating the proper life cycle stage. We do count above that what we see, but it's very difficult to, to discern first, second, third instars uh, amongst each other above that eight feet. It's just difficult to see. But what we see here on this site is that all the way through August, we really didn't have any population on those 50 red maples to start to, uh, to speak of. And then suddenly around the end of uh, August, we start to see the population just start to tick up with the adults. And then at the end of September, we see this massive spike and that correlates really well with what Phil was just showing and that site with the, um, where they had the tarps on the ground, he saw his population drop off there. And we, and we see this timing move to red maples. And going back to, uh, to Joe Francais, to, to some of the other people I've heard about walnuts, really where we see that walnut uh, going on is in that, that mid-August range, fourth in stars, really see a push to walnuts. But that, that's a different talk for another time. Um, and, and so we see this. We see them populate, that population fluctuation and that red line being what we see in that first eight feet, above that eight feet, we can see the adults very clearly up through the canopies. You see that number just spike at the end of September. And so in that two week period, we saw that spike go from 509 across 50 trees, not very many per tree, up to 16,400. And it was a, a, an insecticide trial site. We know we killed about 9,500. And so when you add that in, our average um, influx there was about 516 per tree in a two-week period. And that's really when we see a lot of people panic and we see a lot of uh, those things. If you were watching the outreach yesterday, when we see the flamethrowers being reached for, we see all kinds of, of things that shouldn't be used to try and kill them. And people kind of freak out and, and it's understandable. And and so we, we look at this, can we predict where they're going to be? Can we realistically do that in the landscape this is a, a shopping center in in collegeville pennsylvania montgomery county and what we did there in 2010 was we broke it down the parking lot by by uh into groups and we went out and we looked at each individual tree in there and this is an extremely manipulated landscape um, this is exactly what i'd refer to as the urban there's nothing really growing in there aside from some weeds that aren't intended and when we break that down and we look at the different tree species in those lots, and this particular lot here, lot D, we have five crab apples, one Yoshino. You can see that the species of trees, and these are the numbers of the, of the tree by species, and these are the counts. And if we look at the maples, the red maples make up overwhelmingly what was present on this site. And so when we look at that and we looked across all those parking lots, in a one day shot, overwhelmingly per inch of DBH of stick, we see that there's 13.24 uh, lanternfly adults per inch of DBH and no other species of the species that are present on that site came close. And this goes back to that, that question of what are they most likely to, to go after? The answer is always gonna be, it depends what's available on the site, which is very frustrating uh, for folks that are trying to learn what they should be preparing for. If Tree of Heaven is there, that will be what they go for at certain times of the year. And as Phil just alluded to, as we see that, that break off uh, most of the time, right? It's not always that way. And so what chemicals are we gonna use to, to treat on, on something like this? Well, the application timing in October, it's not good for getting uptake of a systemic. You can use your pyrethroids, you can use a, a contact. Um, and if the legs are already being laid and done, should you still be trying to spray that pesticide uh, if you're wrapping up the season and they're just kind of hanging out? And, and to that, that end of integrated pest management and trying to reduce the impacts of unneeded uses of insecticides, 
it really makes a difference on your timing. I would say go to the website and under the manage um, bar there, you'll find our new management guide. Julian, Julian was showing this yesterday. This is really a fantastic resource. Amy Corman was referencing this yesterday and we break that down and there's other, there's other publications we have that can help with that. There is no silver bullet with this. We have a lot of insecticides that do very well against this insect. A lot of contact insecticides, a lot of systemics, and it really matters how you're gonna apply it. As Phil was just showing with injection versus trunk spray, uh, as David and, and Rick were talking about this morning, doing those, those big applications, doing contact sprays, the life cycle makes all the difference. The life stage, the timing, it makes all the difference as well as where you're doing this at. We have those management guides. I highly recommend that if you're going to do treatments that you look at them. Um, and then we look at that egg deposition timing. And Julie we talked a little bit about this, been working with Dennis Calvin on this. Consistently, we see that Equinox, and this is that top in 2020, and this is the lower eight feet of those red maples there. And this is by week, we go out, we physically mark, when each egg mass is laid that we can see and reach with a lumber crayon, different colors for different weeks. And you see that that deposition all takes place around, at least in southeastern Pennsylvania in basically a one month period. And so if you can, if you have a Christmas tree farm and you wanna try and prevent egg deposition, this is a great time to get a contact spray down there, not because you're worried about the feeding damage, but to try and prevent as many egg masses from being laid as possible. Um, this is what it looks like. You can see the different colors for different weeks. And we did hand sprayed oversight trials last fall. We did timings of December, March, and April. As Phil was just saying, you have to be careful with the temperatures. And um, we are looking at it more as a whole tree concept and uh, where the golden oil is being used at the 50%, mostly on the trunk, we are more concerned about the buds that might be sprayed and the conversations come up. Should we be using uh, ovicides on all nursery material that's being shipped out of the quarantine zones? And, and the, the answer is it's very difficult to do so without having damage to the plants, especially some plants are extremely sensitive to uh, the ovicides, to the, to the uh, petroleum oils especially and so what we did was 50 percent golden oil we did three percent pure five percent pure oil both petroleum uh, to petroleum oil and um, we did four percent in peed which is insecticidal soap applied alone in um, december march and april and then we did that in december and march followed by three percent pure oil in april and the reason we did the insecticidal soap is that that quote waxy covering is actually a protein and it it washes away pretty quickly with soap uh, what spencer was showing earlier with the eggs are fascinating the way we went out and and found out our hatch rate was we get out there with magnifying glasses we get into uh this with dental picks and we look at those eggs and spencer showed the image of the trap door is fantastic and i love the fact that we call it the same thing it's the the, the trap door we go out and we physically probe them with with dental picks and see how we do. And when we got done with all those hand applications, the 50% golden oil did the best, statistically different. And also the 4% in peed soap in December did better. The idea being that we took that waxy, not wax coating off and allow those eggs to be exposed to the environment and desiccate. And the only problem I have to point out here is that when we did the 4% soap in December followed by April oil, somehow we got better than, than our control hatch here. And so this is showing the percentage, um, the proportion of hatching. And Joe Keller did this, uh, which is just, I think the greatest graph because then what he did was he broke down and this shows a little bit like what Phil was just showing, what percentage of those groups, he had them grouped together. And, and, and what Joe did here is he took each individual egg mass in that study and each circle represents an egg mass, the bigger the circle, the more eggs. And you can see where the individual egg masses lined up. And so even though we have 50% golden oil in April doing very well for control, I mean, we're, we're down in, into the very similar to Phil's numbers, you know, 80 to 90% control. We also have at least one egg mass with 100% hatch and a good number of them pushing uh, 50, 60%. And so uh, this, this gives us an idea of what we can 
we can expect realistically. Um, in our management guide, we say that you can get up to 70 to 80% control. And so when we look at that as, a, as an operational uh, recommendation for landscapers, for arborists that are gonna go out and do that treatment, we look at the egg mass deposition in uh, Topton at the site, and we know that, that uh, of those 50 red maples, we're showing what eggs were laid in that, 50, in that first eight foot. And then the blue lines there are what's laid above eight feet. And we see that over half that we can see from the ground and verify. And again, Joe Keller said, we, we're about 50% accurate from the ground. I'd say we're a little better when we're there monitoring week to week because we catch them when they're lighter colored and stick out more. Um, and they fade pretty quickly. But, you know, from there to 2021, we, we see the same thing. Most of those eggs are laid above that eight foot. That's easily reach from the ground or treat it as a spot treatment. And, and this goes back to uh, the work that Dennis Calvin did a few years ago, where we see that in, and this is, this, I really have to say, this is, this study is done um, with trees that are in the wooded area where their lower branches don't start from many, many feet above the ground, many meters above the ground compared to our ornamentals that I'm looking at where they're more uniformly structured. But what Dennis Calvin showed is that 70, 75, 85% of the egg masses are located above that nine meter mark. And so and when we think about that operationally, how are we gonna treat that? And, th and the way it's gonna be done is a hydraulic gun. And this is what we did. I worked with, with Greg Krawcheck on this and his team. And we went to a site in Lehigh County. And I will say that right up front, we had 203 egg masses, almost 5,000 eggs in this trial, not the best replicated, but we were limited on trial size and replication by site. But what we saw out of this, um, we had dry control, water control, we'd had the 4% Lesco, 3%, 5%, right? And we did the golden oil, 6%, 15%, and 28%. And this is where I have to specify really clearly what Phil was saying about going out and doing that application. You can do it right through February, and that's good on a tree trunk. If you are at all concerned about buds, I'm going to show you why you need to be a little bit more careful and conservative in, in your application timing. You can see that these trees were already starting to flower and not optimum, but we had a very late cold snap last fall. That cold snap put us into a period where we couldn't get above, we didn't have above freezing temperatures at night. And anyway, what we saw here was in this trial, we did very well. Um, most of, the, most of the, the products were statistically better. And again, thank you, Joe Keller. We still have pretty good hatch on some of these, these rates, even though they're statistically better. Some of those egg masses are still pushing 70, 80% hatch. So it's a reduction. We can get a reduction. Is it going to be the be all end all? I'm not very confident with it. And like I said, we go out, we go out with dental picks and magnifying glasses and check our hatch. And, and it's, a, it's a brutally boring job, but needs to be done. And so going back and checking that against how do we do? Well, our 50% golden oil by hand is very similar to our golden oil at 28%. Looks good. The caution here, and this is what I was saying about the leaf buds, those, those leaves cooked. The... The flowers that were open, they pushed out their seeds, and then the fun, when after the seeds pushed, we saw that the, the leaf buds were nuked. And you can see very clearly in this tree, this is later on in June, you can see the leaves that were cooked, and you can see also probability of that greener uh, center wasn't very well covered by the gun. So then the other, the other thing in our, in our recommendations with this, cost-wise for a 35-foot maple, um, about 20 inch DBH. It took 10 gallons of mix to get that, that level of coverage. Mixing that golden oil at a cost of five gallons at 345.90. And this is a price I was able to just pull up um, from a supplier. Application cost roughly an hour with an arborist. You're looking at almost $500 for a whole tree application. And so when we talk to the public, that extension end, we say, you can do this, you can get up to 70% control, but uh, you know, 
you have to understand that you're not going to get 100% control and it's very expensive by the trade. So we go back and we look at this. This is that population timing. Where are they? When are they? Uh, this is what Julie uh, showed a little bit yesterday. We see that population timing moving. Uh, we see this is a site, Meadowood in Montgomery County, all through June in 2020. We have nothing. We see that same uptick in September and with the adults. And when we put 2021 on there, you can see that the adults were very different this year on that site. We see on in August, we see, we see our early spike. We had movement then, and then they kind of just vacated the scene and were present in very low numbers. This represents 56 trees. And so if we're only seeing 150 at egg laying time, you know, across 56 trees, there's not much there. And does it warrant that application? And that's a, a, a question to be asked when we're dealing with this in terms of an IPM approach, should we be carpet bombing with a pyrethroid when there's so low numbers? And the question then is, well, how many eggs did they lay? On that site in Meadowood, the green bars are how many eggs they laid across the uh, 56 trees in 2020. The red ones are how many we saw deposited in 2021. So remarkably lower. And, um, you know, really, what does it mean? Well, in Topton, we saw that spike again this year, the green line in that, that egg laying period. And that spike for the all combined the top to top for 50 trees, it is nowhere near what we saw in 2021. However, our egg deposition is really, really pushing closer. And so what does that mean? Well, they were there at egg laying time, the adults, that's probably first and foremost that that just happened to be the timing when they were on that site compared to the other site. But now, should we be concerned about this being an uptick again next year? And so we, we asked this question, is the population collapsing? I've had that interview. I've had so many people ask this question. It's been to every extension office in this end of the state. Where are they? Where did they go? Did it collapse? Should we treat? The should we treat question, um, if they're not there, IPM tells us that, they should, that we should. Uh, you know, is it worth it to go out and kill all those non-targets to get just a couple? My guess is no. My, my feeling is no. Back to that site in Montgomery County, the, the uh, shopping center, when we did our survey this year, we had 146 on those maples compared to 4,700 4, on our one-day count. And I can say that in 2021, we did monitor a subset of those trees in each lot throughout the summer. So I know that this wasn't that they were there and then gone. They stayed low, they stayed suppressed. They're not gone, but they're not there. This shopping center manager spent over $35,000 treating for insects for a lanternfly last year, did not treat this year. And this, you know, you look at these population numbers. Now, when it comes to the eggs, the eggs that we saw in 2020 in the shopping center were 314. Most of these trees are smaller, they're stunted, they're, they're, they're island trees, shopping uh, parking lot island trees. We had about half as many eggs deposited this year. Nowhere near the right proportion for the adults that we saw. Um, but I think this is more probability to do with that the trees are very small and not exactly favored for egg laying. But we don't know. When we, Julie talked about the, the um, poll study, the utility poll study that we're doing, this is great. This is three years of population study here. And she showed this yes, yesterday where our, our 2019 numbers that we killed with these poll traps are, are big. Our 2020 uh, numbers are lower. Our 2021 numbers are so low that they're negligible. They just never, I think it was a, just about 1,300 for the whole season compared to the 14,000 the first year. And so we asked that question, are they gone? Is the population really declining like it looks like there? And, and from that site where the poll traps are to where we did a, uh, a Bavaria trial in Blue Marsh this past fall, it's only three and a half, 3.6 miles away. And these are the numbers on the Atlantis trees at the uh, Blue Marsh site where we were following and we were doing insecticides here 
uh, dinotafuron applications as well as Bavaria applications. And we're seeing number per tree across 20 trees, 200, you know, consistently moving, moving through there. This is this little blip here is an application. This is an application. Numbers per inch are mo very much higher. Now that's 3.6 miles away from where the population has declined so drastically three years in a row. And this is what it looked like. This is honeydew coming out of an Atlantis tree in that Blue Marsh Bavaria trial in uh, the end of September. This is the amount of honeydew volume coming out. Um, and, and so can we say that the population is gone in Berks County? Can we say it? No, we can't. We can say it is spotty from site to site. A few miles makes a big difference. Across the sites that, that I've been involved with monitoring, we see just drastic reduction in numbers. Um, percent lower, well, here's the shopping center, right? We're 97% fewer seen this year than the previous year. We get to Topton, you know, 75% fewer seen. This is total counts across the board. And so, you know, the numbers are down in all of these areas. The question is why? What Spencer was showing with the, the late development of the eggs, I think is very much to do with. We had a very cold snap after hatch started this year, it really stalled things. And I wonder, does that make a difference? We're seeing a lot of native predators picking up assassin bugs, wheel bugs. We have weather, we have host fitness decline. Well, there are areas that can take you where we have population drops where the host fitness is just fine. The Atlantis are standing strong, uh, strong, and we have just greatly reduced numbers from just two years ago. I, I would say all of it is probably has something to do with it, just population dynamics. Can we say it's a collapse? No, I don't think we can. We can say that we are seeing greatly reduced numbers in some areas, and we have to get better at looking at that three and a half mile range. We have to get better at looking further out. We have to get better at looking at what host, speed, host plants are on. If they don't necessarily need those trees early on in the spring and they're just as happy to feed on, on um, lush growth of viburnums and everything else, and I didn't get into all that today, there's not enough time. We need to be better at looking at the whole bigger picture. And so these are the technicians and uh, two, two volunteers that helped they do just the most amazing work and it's so exciting i know for them to be out there when they're counting zero after zero after zero through july on those trees uh, but they do it and they do a great job of it so thank you and um, here's our assassin bugs we've been seeing a lot of assassin bug eggs being deposited near the same uh, areas or amongst the lanternfly eggs and that's what the juvenile assassin bugs are doing when they hatch. They hatch remarkably close timing. And of course, the adult, the adult lanternfly uh, getting killed by the adult um, assassin bug. So with that, I will stop sharing. All right. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, I think yep. there's a, a couple of questions. If you could, uh, if you wouldn't mind going into the um, Q&A to answer those. I think the last two are for you and uh okay. we're, we're up against um uh the lunch break so just try and keep on track and keep on schedule we'll probably just uh break now for lunch and then uh come back at uh 1 30. uh jay did you have anything you wanted to add or say nope yeah that sounds great greg so yeah we'll come back at 1 30. all right thanks brian thank you